Hello, my name is Kevin O'Brien. I'm the Assistant Director of Finance and Administrative Services for Parish and School Services for the Diocese of Fort Worth, Texas. I'm here today to talk to you about internal controls. The first reaction most people have when they hear about internal controls is usually that of trying to deter fraud, which is one of the primary reasons for this. But there's also a secondary reason and a secondary benefit from internal controls that in many ways is much more important, and that is the increase in transparency that it can provide to you and to your parish. I'd like to start off with a quote from the, the Second Vatican Council, and that is, the Second Vatican Council itself has recommended that the laity call to active participation in the life and activity of the church, contribute their knowledge, experience, and special skills to make more efficient the administration of the material resources of the church. This quote is taken from the fifth book of Canon Law, and it discusses, which is discussing the temporal goods of the church. The church, in her wisdom, has actually realized that it can draw upon the experiences and the expertise of the laity to help her in fulfilling her ministries and the business that she is about. Now, ultimately, I would not always necessarily categorize the church as a business. However, the church has business that it needs to, that it needs to attend to. And it makes sense to draw on the laity and their special skills to be able to look at industry and the world around itself and to find best practices, to baptize those best practices and bring them into the church where appropriate. And internal controls are one of those best practices. The primary purpose of internal controls is to aid a parish in stewardship and the use of its resources. It's to help eliminate fraud and increase transparency within a parish. Now in looking at this, what I'd like to do is refer to what's called the triangle of fraud, which are the three major factors that lead to someone actually committing, some of the, uh, committing fraud itself. The first factor we want to look at is the inclination. This is an interior disposition of someone who is willing to go to certain lengths or to all lengths to achieve a certain end. The second factor in someone's life is pressure. These are outside forces that come in and can affect someone in their decision making. This could be the loss of a job. This could be mounting medical bills for themselves or a loved one. This could be that someone's business has, has uh, taken a, a poor turn or that someone's being crushed by a, a load of debt because they've been living beyond their means for too many years. These all can create pressure and turmoil in someone's life. And lastly, we need to look at the third factor, which is opportunity. This is the chance for them to be able to take advantage of a situation to help alleviate, even temporarily, some of this pressure that they're feeling in their lives. The only thing that an organization, and particularly a parish, can control of these three factors is opportunity. And that's exactly what internal controls do, is they help to reduce those opportunities. Now for uh, some resources I'd like to point you to is the USCCB actually provides a lot of support for internal controls. And they've actually produced several documents to actually help you in looking at and implementing internal controls. One of those is actually called Diocesan Internal Controls, a framework and I provided the web address for you to take a look at. One of the primary tenets of internal controls is the breakup of specific duties. There's a catchphrase that you'll see a lot, it's called the segregation of duties. The idea is to break up the, uh, a certain function into different parts so that way you have more eyes looking at it and you increase the transparency of what's happening. An, ex uh, an example for this would be looking at the purchases, a purchase transaction in your parish. You have to break up who has the ability to authorize a transaction, who records the transaction, and then ultimately who reviews and reconciles the transaction. So if you're looking to purchase something, say like a, a new copier or a refrigerator, you have the authorization, which is going to be your pastor. He's the one who has the ability to sign, sign the checks and to authorize the transaction. The recording is your bookkeeper. And lastly, you have re review and reconciliation, which is the specific area where the finance council can step in and support in this area. They should be reviewing and reconciling the bank account statements. Proper segregation of duties requires people, and that's one of the, uh, one of the tricky parts about it. In a small or rural parish, number of people can be something difficult to overcome. Uh, I've worked with many parishes where it's a staff of two. You have the pastor and the bookkeeper or secretary who works part-time or maybe four or five hours a week very difficult to create a segregation of duties with only two individuals, and that's exactly where the Finance Council comes in. You have the experience and the expertise and the ability to step in and help out 
in these few areas to provide that third break and that third segregation. It's important to remember, and unfortunately we've seen too much of it in the church, that a bookkeeper or another individual who has the ability to record the transaction, who has access to a rubber stamp that has the pastor's signature, a signature stamp, and is the only one who ever looks at or reconciles the bank account, can unfortunately rob a parish blind for years before something happens. Fraud is a slippery slope. It's something that occurs because of pressure or an outside incident. Someone, usually with a good intention, needs a little help to get over a hump. If I just do this this one time, then I'll pay it back in just a few weeks and everything will be just fine. And something happens and they can't. And then another outside force comes in and causes it again. And then again. And eventually it gets to a point that they can't dig themselves out of the hole that they put themselves into and they choose to dive in. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the concept of internal controls and some of the benefits and, uh, uh, and some of the things that it's trying to, to help prevent. So let's give you something that's a little more meaty, something that you can actually dig your teeth into. What could you actually do to uh, help with implementing internal controls and what are some more examples of this? Again, we're going to turn to the USCCB, which has produced a document uh, entitled Diocesan Financial Issues. And again, I've given you the website on the slide. In section II, this actually pertains specifically to parish financial management. And inside there includes what is called the internal, que internal controls questionnaire. This is an in-depth questionnaire that will take you through a broad range of questions to look at your, your parish and evaluate how you're doing your, how you go about doing business. How do you go about taking care of the things and the administrative procedures that you need to to live out your daily life? This is the internal questionnaire is something that is an excellent tool for a finance council or for finance council, council members to perform each year, and preferably not always the same council member, so you don't wear this, you don't wear this person out. This isn't a type of questionnaire where you can sit down in an afternoon and go through and kind of check off the list. This does require a little bit of extra effort. You're probably going to need to spend some time interviewing a few of the employees or the staff or the volunteers and spend a little bit of time observing how they go through and do their daily processes. However, the tool is excellent for uncovering and identifying opportunities for you to improve the organization to reduce the opportunities for someone to take advantage of it. It's very important to note that this tool is actually a process for self-evaluation and to increase transparency. This is not to be used as an actual evaluation of an employee or of a pastor and their performance. It, it truly is beyond the scope of the Finance Council to look at making hiring and firing decisions. However, this is a very powerful tool that can actually provide great insight into the sophistication and how well the parish is being run. Now, it can be overwhelming sometimes when you first look at this tool and it identifies all the different opportunities that are there. It's best to take them in stages and to look at and plan the change over time. Ultimately, in looking at some of these, you want to go ahead and prioritize a lot of the changes that you, that you may see on there. For instance, improvements to cash handling and to bank account management would probably take precedent over general administration or developing financial reports. Internal controls are truly an integral part of our call to be good stewards. And your bishop, whether explicitly or impl implicitly, and your parish members are all looking to you, the finance council members, to be able to look at the organization and help them in making sure that the resources and the sacrifices that our members are making are actually being put to good use. Controls are not popular, and unfortunately change is difficult as well. So you have a difficult task ahead of you. But the right thing to do is not always the easy and the simple thing or the popular thing to do. You all, the Finance Councils play such an important role. You play an important role in the parish and for what you, and by bringing your skills and your talents to bear. You have a difficult task ahead of you, and I pray that God will continue to bless you and your ministry.